Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another Adventure in Pure Mathematics. In this video, I want to talk about sheaf cohomology in dimensions greater than one. So the way we'll set it this up is using check cohomology, which is a version of cohomology which is quite computable. And we'll use it to actually compute the cohomology uh, of coherent sheaves, certain coherent sheaves on projective space. Okay, so let's look at the setup that we have here. So this is a setup that we can use when x is a quasi projective variety over some algebraically closed field. To work with uh, check cohomology, we need some open affine cover, just as we defined it in the case for curves. So in this case here, uh, we'll write x as the union of open affines u0 up to um. In the case of curves, you just need two of them. Uh, if you're in the uh, case of a projective variety of dimension d, you'll need d plus one of them. And that's quite easy to see from the fact that uh, the projective space itself uh, has an open affine cover consisting of d plus one uh, affine spaces. Okay, so just as in the dimension one case, uh, we construct a check complex uh, that uses intersections of these open sets. So we'll need some notation for that. Okay, so if we pick uh, indices i0 up, up to ip, then u subscript this i0 up to uh, ip is going to be the intersection of the corresponding open affines in my open affine cover. Now uh, you can define check, uh, this check complex and check cohomology uh, for arbitrary sheaves, uh, but it won't give you the uh, actual uh, sheaf cohomology uh, uh, unless you're in the situation where we have a quasi-coherent uh, sheaf. So let's suppose now here that f is quasi-coherent and we're going to define firstly in this check complex, okay, the pth term in here. So this is for p greater than or equal to zero. What we do is that we look at uh, p plus one of these uh, open affines. So we'll look at the indices i0 less than i1 all the way up to ip. Uh, we're going to look at that open set, which is the intersection of those, so that's some other uh, affine open set. And we just look at the sections of f over that. And we do this for all possible p plus one fold intersections of opens. Okay, so that's going to be the uh, uh, billion groups inside this uh, check complex. Okay, and now we need some sort of differential that goes from cp f to cp plus one f. And so essentially the idea is uh, you want to take elements inside here. So that means for each of these p plus one fold intersections, okay, you have all these sections to find out these p plus one fold intersections. We're going to restrict them to p plus two fold intersections, open sets. So how do we do that? So alpha, let's suppose we have this set of these um, sections. Okay, we're going to define this d alpha and uh, so what is this d alpha? So I guess this is going to be a tuple and it's going to be a tuple running over all the p plus two fold intersections of open sets. So I'll call these betas and what is this beta? So how do I get that? So this is going to be an inter alternating sum. So this is similar to what we saw in the case of um, the dimension one. And what we do is we look uh, at the index i zero up to i p plus one. So you're intersecting these p plus two open sets now. So what we can do is we look at the corresponding uh, situation where we just have p plus one of these p plus two indices. So suppose we just omit L, okay? So suppose we omit the Lth one, that will give us p plus one of these indices. So we look at the alpha corresponding to that. So that's some section defined on some p plus one fold intersection, okay? And then we restrict that to this p plus two fold intersection, okay? So that'll just give us an element of the cp plus 1 f okay and the pth check cohomology of f is just defined to be the pth cohomology of this complex so i won't check that this is a complex okay that's actually not too uh, difficult to do it's a little bit tedious but that's something that you can do uh, something else to note is that um, uh, this definition is nice and computable but of course it uh, a priori depends on the actual choice of the open affine cover Okay, so uh, one of the things to realize is that I guess uh, what we've really done is to find the check cohomology of, you can apply this for sheaves, um, but it's with respect to this open affine cover. 
The general check homology, you do it by looking at all possible covers, and you need to look at refinements of these as well, so that gets a little bit complicated, but you can do that. And the point is that uh, in this special case here, if you work with a projective or quasi-projective variety, and this is an open affine cover, and uh, you have a quasi-coherent sheaf, then this will actually give you the cohomology, okay? So it's actually independent of the choices that are made here. So that's rather nice. But in general, it will depend if you just have a sheaf, okay? Um, uh, not a quasi-coherent sheaf, it will depend on this choice, okay? So the other important thing is that because of the way we set this up, so of course this is very, very natural, okay? If you have a morphism of uh, quasi-coherent sheaves, this will give you a morphism on these, uh, uh, these groups here in the complex and a morphism of complexes. So uh, if you have a short exact sequence of quasi-coherent sheaves, then you get a long exact sequence in these check cohomology. Okay. So let me show you how it's actually reasonably uh, easy to compute the cohomology, okay? At least it's something that you can do, okay? It requires a little bit of work, but it's something that you can do. And I'll do that to compute some of the cohomology. So I mainly want to tell you about what the cohomology is, but I'll show you some of the computations at least. And I guess to do this, we need to have some open affine cover for the projective space. Uh, so that's d-dimensional. So the usual, we'll use the standard one. So if we have coordinates x0 up to xd on pd, uh, we'll just look at the open affine cover consisting of the ui where xi is non-zero, the i coordinate is a non-zero. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at the cohomology. So I guess H0 is the most important one. This one, we don't really need this definition to find that, okay? Um, so uh, what is H0 of ON? So the sheaves I want to look at are just these uh, um, ONs, these uh, line bundles, those invertible sheaves there. And this, uh, the answer is very similar to what you see with P1, okay? What you can do is you can look at the homogeneous coordinate ring, which is KX0 up to XD, the polynomial ring in D, uh, uh, d plus 1 variables, okay, and this is a graded ring where each of these x's is degree 1, and we can look at the degree n part, okay, so this is a complete analogy to what we see in the case of P1 that we've looked at in this playlist, okay, so that's rather nice. In particular, if n is negative, okay, this will be 0, okay, but when n is uh, equal to 0, you'll get k, so that's one dimension, when n equals uh, 1, then you'll get uh, a d plus one dimensional space, which is a linear span of these uh, x zero up to x d, and so forth. Okay, so uh, what about the other uh, cohomology groups? Okay, so if i is such that it doesn't equal zero or d, which is the dimension of this projective space, then you'll get zero for these things. Okay, so that's rather nice and simple. Remember, when high cohomology vanishes, okay, uh, that's a good situation because that means that we have uh, exactness results on H0. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why we study cohomology. So HD, however, can be non-zero. Okay, and that's something we expect. Uh, there has to be something non-zero because this formula should work in the case d equals 1. Okay, so h1 uh, is often non-zero. And uh, for p1, so h1 of p1 was non-zero when you have things which are ne very negative, oh, very negative things here. Okay, and we saw that we had a sad duality, so we have a sad duality type result here, okay? hd, pd of the way I write this is, if you look at o of minus n minus d minus 1, this is naturally isomorphic to the h0 of um, uh, o of n, uh, dualized, okay? So, so there's this duality between this hd term here for this line bundle and this uh, h0 term here. And notice that these two, um, they are uh, not quite negatives of each other. They're, it's a shift of the negative, okay? Shifted by, uh, in this case here, d plus one, you subtract this d plus one, okay? So that's the number of variables here. Okay, now we saw something similar in the case of P1, okay? Uh, so this is the, the result that you have. So let me just show you roughly how you can actually compute things here. Um, but before I do that, I guess I want to just show you this uh, because this is going to be important for our calculations. Okay, so I'll just sketch uh, uh, some of the computations here. If you want to look at ON, Okay, one way to think about that sheaf, uh, just think of it up to isomorphism. So uh, what I will do is I'll embed this inside the sheaf of rational functions, it's O-N-H, 
where h is the hyperplane where x0 equals 0. Okay? So this is a sheaf. This is just a sheaf of all rational functions with pole of order at most n at h. Okay? And no other poles. Okay. So uh, let's just do the Im most important case where n is greater than or equal to 0. Okay? Uh, but once n is negative, you see, uh, this is all the rational functions which have no poles and a zero of order when this is negative, a zero, at least some zero along h. And so, of course, the only such uh, regular functions now uh, are going to be the constant zero. Okay. So here, watch h zero of O and h. Okay, so you're looking at rational functions. Okay, so you look at rational functions. So you have uh, some polynomial. Uh, homogeneous polynomial on a homogeneous polynomial, they're the rational functions that you get um, on, on PD. And you're only allowed poles where, uh, uh, on this hyperplane x0 equals 0. So you can only divide by some x0 uh, to, um, to some power. Okay? And since the pole has order at most n, well, you can make that x0 to the n. Okay? It could be less than that, but if it's less than that, I guess we can put some x0s up the top. And then the polynomial up the top, has to be equal in degree to the one down the bottom. So it's any polynomial you like in x0 up to xd of degree n. And then, of course, if we're going to look at this, we want to look at this as a vector space, OK? A vector space over k. And so I guess the easiest way to think of this is, well, you just multiply by x0 to the n. And so it's just this vector space of degree n elements in this polynomial ring. In fact, looking at this thing here, okay, it's a bit asymmetric how I've done it. I've chosen a hyperplane here, x0 equals 0. And so if you want to avoid this, okay, uh, if you want to make it more symmetric, this is the symmetric way to write it. So really, you should think of the global sections of this as equal to this here. Okay? That's the most symmetric way to write it, rather than the set of these. Okay? And that's a viewpoint that we'd like to take uh, when we do more calculations. Okay, so I, want to, I don't want to do the calculations for B. That's quite a little bit more complicated, but it's quite interesting to see that uh, C is quite computable. I won't do, go through the whole uh, calculation in detail, but you see that it's actually not too bad. Okay, so what's happening here when you look at HD? Okay, so the first thing is that um, you want to look at cohomology, and you've got... Uh, so, so what you do is you want to look at um, the cohomology in spot D, so you want to look at CD. That's the first thing here. So what is this CD? Okay, CD. So again, we'll use the same thing. Uh, uh, we, we'll look at O minus N minus D minus 1. Okay, and we'll exhibit this as O minus N minus D minus 1 times H. Okay. So uh, we'll think of this as a sheaf of rational functions. Okay. So again, you're looking at uh, certain rational functions. And rational functions, uh, where are these defined? Okay, they have to be defined. Since you're in CD, you're looking at this um, intersection of all possible. Uh, so you've got D plus one open sets here, and you're looking at all D plus one open sets, and you're intersecting them all. Okay, so it's where um, all the XIs are non-zero. Okay, but everywhere else it has to be defined. But what that means is that in the denominator, what can you have in the denominator? You can, in the denominator, you're allowed to have any product of these xi's. So you'll look at rational functions of the form where you can have any product of these xi's uh, down the bottom. Okay. And in the top, you'll have something. Okay. So uh, technically, I guess, you should have a zero of order n plus d plus 1 at the top. Okay, and we'll write it like that. Okay, so um, rather than saying a polynomial on some uh, monomial in these xi's, uh, we'll look at the span of these, uh, what I call the rot mon monomials. Okay, so it's x0 to the i0, x1 to i1, all the way down to xd to the id in the numerator, and in the denominator, you have x0 to the j0, all the way up to xd to the jd in the denominator. Okay, so this should be a rational function on uh, uh, PD. So you want the degree of the numerator and denominator to be the same. So the sum of the ILs, the indices at the top, is the sum, same as the sum of the JLs, uh, which is the sum of the indices down the bottom. And I guess technically you also want it to have a, a zero of order n plus d plus 1 uh, at least um, uh, here. Okay, so you want this i to be greater than or equal to n plus d plus 1. Again, what we'll do is we'll try to make this symmetric. So we chose 
this h here but if you want to get rid of that the easiest way to do that is just to say that what well, if i is zero is always at least n plus d plus one let's just get rid of that term okay and divide by uh, so remember these indices should be non-negative integers uh, but what we can do is just remove this n plus d plus one so we're going to multiply by its inverse x zero to the minus n minus d minus one and then what you'll get is that this space here okay this uh, d term in this uh, uh, check complex is just a span of the Laurent monomials where the degree of this is no longer zero because we divide it by uh, we multiply by this but rather the degree of minus n minus d minus one and so that's the best way to think of CD of this uh, line bundle here okay that's the most symmetric form so we haven't favored one open set above the others okay so that's the CD term okay so now let's uh, look at the C oh, I guess we should look at the CD plus one term but in the CD plus one term, of course, um, there's uh, no, uh, you've used up all the open sets, so there's no uh, D plus second open set, so that's zero. Okay, so, so CD plus one is zero, so that means that when we compute this cohomology kernel over the image, the kernel is going to be the whole of the CD. Okay, but now we need to know the image of CD minus one, so let's have a look at CD minus one. So what you do with CD minus 1 is you look at the sections of this sheaf here, um, but over instead of uh, D plus 1 fold intersections, just default intersections okay, of open sets. So what that's, that, does that mean? So to get a default intersection of open sets, that means that one of the indices you don't intersect. Okay? So I suppose that's the L and we remove the L. So I'll put a hat there to say that we don't intersect uh, with UL. Okay? But we intersect U0, U1 and all the other ones, just not with UL. Okay? And then we want to look at the same um, type of thing as we saw over here. So basically this is a section of this which is defined um, on this intersection. So the difference between this one and what you have here is that whereas before okay to be defined on this intersection of all of these you see um, that means that all of the coordinates are non-zero you can divide by any product of these x's okay but now here you can divide by any product of the x's except for xl so that means that you can't have xl in the denominator okay so this is uh, this is the set of Laurent polynomials for, so we're going to do this for each l from zero up to d all the indices we're going to look at the Laurent monomials of degree minus n minus d minus 1, just as we have here. And the only difference is that in this elf term here, you can't have XL in the denominator. Okay. XL is not allowed to be in the denominator. And so this uh, dth cohomology that we want to compute here is just what? This is CD. Okay. Uh, so this is the span of these Laurent monomials of degree minus n minus d minus 1. And then what you do is you look at D of this CD minus 1, which is what? You look at these Laurent monomials, okay, and the, to restrict them to this uh, D plus 1 fold intersection just means that you think of these Laurent monomials as Laurent monomials inside here, okay? So basically you're going to look at um, the space of, or the span of all these Laurent monomials of degree minus N minus D minus 1, modulo the span of all the Laurent monomials uh, of degree minus n minus d minus 1 where one of the xl's is not in the denominator okay so that's the idea okay one of the xl's is not in the denominator okay so if you uh, uh, so if you happen to have a uh, monomial but uh, what happens is that one of the xl's is not in the denominator uh, then actually it'll be zero inside here Okay, so let's uh, have a think about what that's, uh, what's going on there. So one thing to note is that when you're looking at these uh, Laurent monomials, actually, uh, the way I've looked, uh, written it down here, it looks like, well, actually, um, it looks like there's a lot of cancellation that goes on. So actually, when you look at this, of course, uh, at the end of the day, you can write this as a, um, uh, a, a product of some power of x0 up to some power of xd, okay? And uh, you, uh, that power is I0 minus J0, of, that's the power of X0, and so forth, okay? So really, um, there's cancellations. If X0, you might as well assume either occurs in the denominator or the numerator, okay? For each of these XRs, okay, one of them you can assume to be zero, and the other one is going to be non-zero. 
Okay, so let's look at the case and you'll see where this, uh, this d minus d minus 1 term sort of comes up. Okay, so let's look at the case n equals 0. So you're looking at the case where the right monomials have degree minus d minus 1. Okay, and I claim that in this case here, that's the first interesting case, what we want to show that in the case n equals 0 is that here this will be h0 of p d o 0, so it's o. And by this is the degree zero elements of here, so this should be just k. So it should be a one-dimensional vector space. And I claim that it's actually spanned by this Laurent monomial here, one on x zero, x one up to x d. Okay, so that's uh, what you have here. This is a monomial. It's certainly in here. It's of degree minus d minus one. Okay, because you've got uh, these uh, d plus one factors in here in the denominator. Okay, and it's not in any of uh, these here. Okay, because to be in here, that means either x to be in the uh, one uh, corresponding to L means that XL is not in the denominator. But it's got each and every single one of these in the denominator. Okay, so this is not defined, this rational function is not defined on any uh, default intersection of open sets. And you can't even get it as a linear combination of those, right? There's no way you can write it, this as a linear combination of those either. So that's going to be an element in there. And to show that that's actually all that you have, you see, is it's quite simple. Because if you want to find a Laurent monomial, which is not in there, okay, that means that you have to have every single xi in the denominator. Okay, every single one has to appear in. So we might as well, when we look at such a Laurent monomial, okay, pull out this factor. Now this factor already has a, a d plus 1 degree in the denominator, so it's already correct to, to degree. So anything Laurent monomial that's in here, that's not in here, you can write as this times a Laurent uh, monomial of degree 0. So it'll be something like this, okay, something a Laurent monomial of degree 0. And since it's of degree 0, Okay, so I guess one possibility is you have degree 0 and degree 0, so you just multiply by some scalar. But if this is some uh, positive degree and some positive degree, okay, you can find some uh, value of this xi, which is positive degree, okay, some xi in the numerator, and that xi in the numerator will cancel with that xi here, okay, and once that happens, you'll find that, well, that's actually defined uh, on that patch where you remove the, that i, okay? So if you multiply this with some degree zero term, and that degree zero term has something in the numerator, which isn't cancelled in the denominator, so maybe some xl. So that means that xl will cancel with this xl here, and that will force that to be inside here, so it's going to be zero anyway. So that's the reason why this action generates it. So that gives it, in the case, n equals zero. And I hope you can see more generally how do you get uh, the case for n greater than 0. So here now, remember you want things of degree um, minus n minus d minus 1. So certainly you need x0 to up, up to xd in the uh, denominator. And that's of degree minus d minus uh, 1 now. And to make it a minus further minus n, you can multiply by any monomial m, which is uh, inside here, okay, in the polynomial ring uh, of degree n. And if you do that, Okay, so this is a, uh, uh, maybe I should write, uh, yeah, yeah, so that's any monomial inside there. And if you look at this, so that's spanned by such elements and they're going to be linearly independent. If you want to know what the number is, the number is exactly uh, the dimension of H0 of OM. Okay, so we know that these are isomorphic, although perhaps you'd think, okay, why is it natural and why have we set it up this way? And I guess one way to do that is kind of using residue theory. So let me just write it like this, okay? So I want to give you a map from HD of this O n, o minus n minus d minus 1 to the dual of H0 of O n. Okay, so, so let's pick this basis element here just to show you how it works, okay? We pick this basis element. So what is um, it that we uh, get on the dual side here? Okay, so this is a duality, so we have to pick um, a, a, a linear functional which maps P, an element of this global sections, which is just degree n uh, forms in x0 up to xd here. And what we can do is we just do the following. We multiply this P 
by this element. So we look at p divided by x0 to the x d m. And we just look at the coefficient of 1 on x0 up to x d in there. So it's kind of like a residue type of uh, result. And that coefficient is going to give us, that's the map to the dual, okay? That's, uh, that's going to give you the scalar that you would want. And of course, if you have any linear combinations of this, you can quite easily see that, okay, how is this roughly working? So basically, if you take any element inside here, you just multiply this polynomial with this rational function, okay? And you just check the coefficient of this term here uh, to see the pairing that maps you into the scalars. And that kind of gives you that say duality map, which kind of explains why uh, you expect this sort of thing to happen. Okay, so as you can see, um, in this case here, we can actually compute uh, the Dth cohomology, the Dth check cohomology, um, uh, fairly uh, straightforwardly. Okay, so the computations here are somewhat harder. Okay, but I guess you can do them, and there are various ways to do them. But of course, once you've established more theory, there are also other methods for computing this as well. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.